This is the On All Cylinders Podcast. Powered by Summit Racing. Your host for today is Paul Sokolis with Summit Racing's Nicole Corey, Justin Wiederman, and Dave Fuller. Here we go. Hey there, welcome to another super fantastic installment of the On All Cylinders podcast. And uh, all hyperbole aside, we do have a pretty interesting one today because we are debriefing from the 2022 SEMA show. And to help me do that, I've enlisted a trio of Summit Racing employees. And I'm just counting on my fingers here. On this panel, we have about 20 plus years of SEMA show attendance. So if anyone can describe the who, what, when, where, and why of the SEMA show, it would be this group. You guys want to take a quick bit and introduce yourselves? Sure. I mean, I'll start. Uh, I'm Dave Fuller. I work at Summit. I've been to about 15 SEMA shows now and went out there to canvas the show, see what's new, talk about new products. And uh, that's just kind of what I do. I'm Nicole. Um, I also work in the social department. Uh, I went out to kind of cover the show and kind of see the latest trends. What are people swapping into their cars and all that? So I think I've been to like five or six SEMA shows. I'm Justin Wiedemann. I'm uh, the video host and technical advisor. And uh, this was actually my first SEMA show. So Justin gets to be the face of Summit. So he's the popular guy. He's the old guy everybody sees on the videos. He gets all the glory while Nicole and I toil away in the background. Uh, I had a good time. You know, Vegas is um, certainly an interesting place to say the least. Yeah, yeah let's just leave interesting at that. Um, it's a good way to put it. Now, normally this is the part of the episode where I thank you all for joining me and thank you for your time, but, you know, you're all Summit Racing employees. You're kind of obligated to be here, but we're happy to have you on board anyway. Um, so let's just dive in. Can you explain what the SEMA show is to somebody from outside of the industry or somebody that may not be familiar with the SEMA event? It's hard to explain to the person that hasn't been there. I mean, it's millions of square feet of manufacturer displays, and it's just a gathering. It's the biggest gathering of aftermarket companies and enthusiasts all out there to kind of show off new product, display project vehicles, uh, concept vehicles. Uh, you also get some OEs out there as well. Just the opportunity to see what's what's the latest parts to come out for the next year. Yeah, there's really something there at the SEMA show for everybody. So either you're an off-road guy, you're a classic car guy, weird, odd concept vehicles. If you're a tool wheel and tire guy, there's something at that show for absolutely anybody. You see some of the wildest, weirdest vehicles you've ever seen in your life. And now it's worth pointing out that the the, the pandemic canceled SEMA for a while. Um, and this is your first time back in, in the post-COVID era. So let's get that topic out of the way first. Um, was there anything new or, or different that you noticed as a result of that? I think in years prior, from my perspective, there was a lot more show vehicles like outside and also a lot more vendors would have show vehicles in their booths where this year, I think it was a little bit more product focused. They obviously brought in the electric vehicle section. So it was a different landscape. And I also felt like there was a lot more room in between still a lot of people, but it felt like you had a little more breathing room. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that uh, two years of, of COVID, I think that they, they decided to maybe try to keep the crowds down a little bit. Recent years, it had gotten to the point where they were letting a lot of just spectators in that maybe weren't exactly attached to manufacturers or buyers or anything like that. They, they changed that up this year so that they were opening the doors to maybe some outside people on Friday instead of the entire week. So I think they're very cognizant and aware of spacing between people. There is a, also a new hall since the last time I've been out there, which was 2019, uh, the West Hall. They put a lot of the overlanding and, and truck Jeep vehicles out that direction. And I think that helped space it out as well. Uh, so I feel like the show is over a wider footprint, maybe the same amount of manufacturers just spread out a little bit. Dave, you touched on an interesting point that we should bring up again here. On paper, at least, uh, the SEMA show is only open to folks in the industry, be they manufacturers, vendors, etc. But given the awesomeness of the show, people outside the automotive industry try, try to get in. Is that still the norm? Is SEMA loosening the attendance requirements? Not technically, but it seemed like over the years, and again, I've been to a lot of these, that it just got more and more crowded with people that maybe they weren't necessarily with a manufacturer, they weren't a buyer. I feel like they did a better job of keeping that down for the first three days of the show. And then again, I think Friday, they were letting more people in from the public. Yeah, typically, and this is supposed to be for industry only. 
And uh, I think they did a, a good job of keeping it to that, let people uh, do business out there with one another and, and not have to navigate such tight crowds. But it's no secret that, that folks want to get in and experience the SEMA show because it is incredible. From brand new product releases to, to top tier show cars, you know, the automotive aftermarket industry brings their A game. So with that said, what um, at the 2022 SEMA show caught your eye? What really blew you away while you were out there? So there were so many like cool vehicles at the show. It's hard to nail down one for me. Outside the West Hall, there is a beautiful Land Cruiser that I was just in love with. It was kind of like what you call retro mod. So it had a modern like Toyota drivetrain and all that. And the thing was just beautiful. Like it's exactly how I would build one. And then a big joke is on the sidewalk outside of South Hall, there was a Grand Wagoneer sitting out there that was all stock. And it's sitting next to these giant lifted trucks and all this. And I have no cares in the world about the, you know, $120,000 Ford Platinum there. Give me the, uh, you know, the all stock Grand Wagoneer. And that's what puts a smile on my face. I also saw a lot lot of uh, Suzuki Samurais this year, which is, um, you know, my first wheeling rig. Those always put a smile on my face. But there was um, there was a ton of new cool stuff at the show. Our friends over at Blueprint, they have some awesome new crate motors that they're bringing to market. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. Along with um, our friends over at Pectronics, who own JBA headers, they came out with some um, their 50 state legal emissions compliant short tube headers that bolt into place of your stock manifolds. Anybody that drives a uh, you know a 99 to 02 Chevy truck or that generation, those LS manifolds, they uh, over time they crack and break and they leak real bad. And uh, JBA really brought a big answer to the market with a header that's emissions compliant. So that's even better. And they bolt into place. They have real nice thick flanges on them. So there was a lot of cool products. And then our friends over at Milwaukee too. I'm a big tool guy. They uh, they showed up with a new spot weld grinder. I can't wait to order one for uh, for one at home and uh, get one here in our Summit Studios. You know, there's something at the SEMA show that uh, will that itch a scratch for anybody. Lots of fun stuff. Yeah, you're right. There's something for everyone there. But I'd have to say probably like my favorite vendor or display, Dodge had like the coolest layout. Like they had a wraparound screen. It was huge. You could feel the bass from the music had their 2023 Dodge Hornet GT JLH concept. They also had the Daytona SRT and their six last call vehicles in their display. They had like a racing simulator too in the one part of their display. It was, I probably went back a few times. And then there was an FJ49 Land Cruiser that came all the way from Australia. And that was super cool. And then I'm a big Kevin Hart fan. So they did like a 87 Buick Dark Knight reveal. So I thought that was pretty sweet. Yeah, I I would echo Nicole's thoughts on the Dodge display. And and it's in the center of the hall too. So it's like kind of a place where people converge. And then, you know, it's always interesting to go over to Holly because they're always adding new brands and it's kind of cool to see what's going on there. So I had an opportunity to go tour around uh, with what they've got going on. As far as different parts at the show, uh, Edelbrock has some Ford Godzilla parts. I'm actually a little surprised. I personally didn't see more parts for that engine out there, but that's not to say that they weren't there. It's such a huge show that, you know, the possibility, I just didn't see it, but I thought that was cool. Gen 3 Hemi stuff, Justin mentioned, you know, Blueprint's got uh, something going on with that as far as crate engines. Uh, so lots of parts for that. And then as far as the vehicles go, just kind of wrapping it up, saw a lot of Baja vehicles, Porsches and, and Bugs and stuff like that. Those are interesting. And then, of course, the stuff that Summit was involved in. We, we got involved with a lot of 70s vehicles this year, which were kind of cool. Uh, there was a, a cruising wagon that we had uh, partnered on that came out really nice. Um, the paint was immaculate on it. It's a Cool Hand Customs build. Uh, we had a, a early 70s Javelin that we had uh, partnered on. And then uh, there was also a Jeep build that we did. And I'm going to cut in real quick, Dave. Say, if you want to see these uh, project vehicles, just go to onallcylinders.com. Um, there's a search bar up there. For the wagon, for instance, you can type in Ford Pinto. For the Jeep Cherokee, it was called Sasquatch. So you can type in Sasquatch. And for that AMC, you can just type in Javelin SST, and they'll pop up right away. And I wanted to circle back and say that's some pretty good insight on those new products because it kind of gives you like an idea of where the aftermarket industry is going for these new engines like the Godzilla, for instance. Actually, when you were talking about some of the products, I kind of forgot 
Orla did come out with that performance active sound kit. That was pretty cool that we did a write up on. And then Turbo Smart was like a wastegate that they came with that they won a new yeah. product award for. Yep. Yeah, it was so, like a pneumatic version of their current wastegate system, but they did win an award for that. So we've talked about some specific engines, some specific parts. Um, let's take a broader look at some of the, the automotive trends that you may have noticed while you were out there. Was there like a hot in-demand vehicle this year? As an example, in previous years, like before the Bronco was released, everyone was buzzing about the Bronco, and certainly the the mid-engine Corvette was another one. And I still remember how that classic GM square body pickup truck just exploded in popularity seemingly overnight. Did you notice anything like that? Electric, you know, it's some people are about it, some are not. But the fact is, just, you know, reporting what we saw, there was a lot. There was a whole section with electric conversions. Uh, there was a lot of uh, seminars and educating on on that uh, in that West Hall. Even out, you know, like within the Holly booth, there was an electric conversion there. So just converting over old cars and trucks, um, I saw a lot of that. That is definitely something that you know manufacturers are thinking about as as we move forward. I saw a lot of off road Tacoma and Tundra builds, which was kind of fun, a little bit different. Maybe I was just noticing them more this year versus previous years, but I definitely saw a lot of that. Yeah, I agree, Nicole. I mean, everybody loves a good taco. So it's, um, you know, building Toyota is, is fun. And you had said about the electric conversion, like when I was walking between halls and I was walking up the sidewalk in front of West Hall, there was like an old style Volkswagen rail buggy that had an electric conversion. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. I was like, I almost have everything laying around my house to build that. That's the kind of stuff I look at where I'm just like, who woke up in the middle of the night one night and was just like, I want to cut apart an electric car and put it in a Volkswagen 2 buggy and go buggy because that is someone I want to be friends with. Well, let's flip that topic back around. Um, we alluded to the Godzilla and the Gen 3 Hemi already, but um, does the LS engine still rule the roost in terms of aftermarket performance? Were there any competitors to, to the throne, so to speak? So there was definitely a lot of LS swaps. It's the small block Chevy of the new generation. You can LS swap anything. Blueprint brought their new Gen 3 Hemi, which will be cool. And now that those have a lot of uh, more aftermarket support than years past, um, I think that's going to become a much more viable swap. Third Gen Hemi is Dodge's LS, and they put it in everything. Now that the aftermarket's here and, you know, you have people like Holly and some other manufacturers making uh, the stuff to make swaps a lot easier, I think that's going to be a lot more viable. I even saw some stuff with Godzilla's in it, you know, 5 Coyotes. Blueprint has a cool new Ford 302. They, uh, they're casting their own block, and they're even doing like a Bronco edition engine for, you know, someone that's restoring an old first-generation Bronco. I saw a big mix at the show, but it's definitely, you know, LS is still big and hot. I think everybody's kind of, you know, following that trend a little bit. The goal is, is to put modern drivetrain in older vehicles and, you know, make it better than it was brand new. Yeah, one trend on top of that, I've noticed a lot more ways to make your LS look different. Justin mentions swapping modern technology into a classic vehicle. Well, now it's swapping technology into a classic vehicle and having the opportunity to make it look like a classic engine. For example, Vitex developed a bunch of uh, velocity stack intakes and things like that to go on your LS. And they're still very focused. Vitex a company that's uh, branching out a little bit into some different engines, but LS is still the big thing for them. Holly says the same thing. They have some Gen 3 things going on uh, there as far as accessories and parts and all that, but LS is still strong for them. But I've just noticed some unique options now for LS swappers. You know, you can you can put that classic 14-inch intake on top and make it look like it's carbureted. And then, you got, like I said, the velocity stack. So different creative options to the old LS swap they make valve covers that look like you can make it look like a big block Chevy or a W head, all these fun valve covers to put on top of your LS valve covers to make it more period correct. And, you know, make somebody look just a little bit harder to figure out what engines in it. Cause you know, as Chevrolet guys, the distributors in the back under the uh, back of the air cleaner. So there's no uh, tall tale sign unless you start really looking hard. Was there any specific engine performance trend that you noticed uh, while you were out there? Uh, it seems like just a couple of years ago, people realized that uh, you could twin turbocharge an LS and the horsepower number would instantly have a comma in it. Did you see anything like that as you toured the halls? Yeah, there's all sorts of fun new intakes. 
You know, you have the old throwback. It looks like Hilburn mechanical fuel injection and it's modern injectors in the side of it. I did see a lot of blower stuff. You can't beat a two or three liter blower sitting on top of something. It's hard to take your eyes off of. There was a nice mix though. There's lots of fun new LS intakes coming out. They're making big advancements in, uh, you know, even sheet metal and cast intake. So that's cool to have more options coming to the market. Yeah, a lot of, you know, forced induction with LS just kind of goes hand in hand. Everybody loves cam swap valve springs and a cheap turbo and you're, you're making all the stink. But with direct injection, I did see some like LT5 swap. I've seen some of those swapped into everything. And uh, that'll be cool when that aftermarket becomes a little more viable because direct injection is sweet. You want to talk about power and fuel burn, um, direct injection is the way. You know, it works the same way as a diesel engine does, just with a spark plug. That is a, that's going to be a really cool thing to see progress in the market and the aftermarket really pick that up and roll with that. Yeah, when some of these engines are coming out of the gate stock with like 11 and a half or 12 to 1 compression, you know that motor's going to have some giddy up. Yeah, it's um, we're night and days past, you know, the eight and a half one compression big block, peanut port big blocks of uh, the said the small era 70s or, you know, 125 horsepower small block Chevy's. <laughs> a far cry from the Malays era indeed. Um, but let's move away from performance for a little bit and talk about styling trends. I mean, are rat rods still a thing? Have the pro touring builds been replaced by a resurgence of pro street builds? Do folks still like vinyl wraps and skinny tires wrapped around big wheels? What can you tell us about the future of aftermarket vehicle styling? So I saw a lot of powder coat and Cerakote was there. So if you're not familiar with the Cerakote, it's like one step past, I would call powder coat. It's a, it's similar to powder coat, but it's a lot stronger. They use it on a lot of firearm parts and stuff like that. It's got temperature properties and stuff with it that powder coat doesn't. I saw a ton of Cerakoted parts this year instead of painting stuff. So I think that's really cool. And, you know, you can dress, you can dress up anything. So that was kind of neat to see the different colors and textures. I saw a powder coat vendor that had like bass boat, big old flake in their powder coat. And I just, that put a smile on my face. That Ed Roth style. I love that kind of stuff, but it's cool to see all those little attentions to detail. And obviously black has been big over the last like 10 years versus Chrome. And I saw a lot of Chrome at the show and, you know, nice polished, shiny things. So. I really enjoy that. But in trucks, you know, big wheels are still big. We want a giant offset 24s that are 16 inches wide or even wider. So it's all a lot of that. But um, there was a nice little mix. It seems like everybody's kind of going to that throwback styling versus the modern sleek kind of deals. That's a little refreshing to me. Like it takes me back to my childhood when you see nice, uh, shiny two-tone square bodies driving down the road. So that's the kind of stuff I pay attention to. I, I noticed the retro vibe as well kind of a throwback to the old 70s paint schemes with the, with the stripes and the vivid colors, bringing that back as a style again. I, I, I noticed a lot of that. I loved it. Some things that maybe it's not a trend, but it catches my eye is just the use of non-V8s and, and the swaps out there. I thought that was kind of cool as well. We don't want to forget about those engines and the opportunities that those provide. So, I mean, especially some of the modern stuff, it's making great power. So people are taking advantage of it. Yeah, like I saw a bear, like it was the first time I'd saw a Barra swapped car in person, which if you're not familiar with the Ford Barra, it's a, referred to as like Ford's 2JZ. So it's very similar architecture and all that. And is um, in Australia, it's the, uh, it's the hot ticket. They weren't popular in America. I don't actually think we ever got a vehicle with one in it, but um, it's cool to see that stuff make its way over here and end up with a giant sniffer on the side, you know, making a thousand horsepower out of a six cylinder. So that is super fun. Like so anything that makes noise, I'm into like that. That puts a smile on my face. Also with, um, you know, the GM three, six direct injected V6s. I saw a couple of those, like you'd said, and those, those are cool. They sound neat. Like they, you know, those came factory in the Cadillacs and, uh, they just sound heinous and they make good power. So it is a nice to see a variety of swaps. I would kind of agree with Justin and Dave on the retro vibe was definitely prevalent. I personally like more of the classic retro kind of style. So it appealed to me, but that was kind of the vibe I was getting. So I thought it was kind of fun that it wasn't too far out there with crazy bright colors, more, more classic. So that's kind of what I saw. Well, then let me ask the same question in kind of a different way then. Even fairly recently, you couldn't walk through the SEMA halls without tripping over a Deuce Coupe or a Tri-5 Chevy. So now, uh, what decades would you say are the best represented? Are we seeing a generational shift towards the 70s, 80s, and 90s? 
I didn't see as much 50s and earlier stuff as in years past. Uh, I saw a lot of classic muscle car, 60s, 70s, even a little bit of 80s. I think people are, are looking at either you know, restoring those or taking advantage of the swap options to convert the fuel injection and things like that. And you've seen a lot of people showcase that. So inside, at least now on the outside of the show, you, you never know what you might see. There's a lot of cars out there too, a lot of trucks and things. But for me, there wasn't as many 50s and earlier uh, vehicles. There were some, but to me, it was more of that classic muscle car era. Yeah, I don't even remember. I think I maybe only saw a couple of classic Chevys, like 50s, 60s. I would have to say probably like 60s and 70s. You saw Camaros, Mustangs, Chevelles, stuff like that. 60s, 70s. Uh, I guess a few 80s, like you were saying, but I th- I thought it was mainly 60s, 70s. Well, that covers like the muscle cars and the passenger cars, but what about the truck market? Did those builds follow the, the retro trend too? Or did you see some ultra-modern retrofits with like LTs, LS? Were they all built into overlanding rigs? Tell us about uh, the truck world out there. So it was it was 50-50 in the, uh, the classic truck kind of deal. That's um, Like I said, that's my bread and butter. That's uh, what puts a smile on my face. So it's either you had the retro throwback, two-tone chrome wheels, you know, a classic set of polished welds or something like that. Just a very, um, a typical 80s, what I would call 80s build square body. And then there was the modern, you know, the black on black on black trucks where it's, you know, it's got black wheels. There's no chrome on it. It's just sleek and it's hot. So there was a a divide in the classic truck market. And then had you had said, there's always, you know, you walk outside and there's just these giant lifted trucks. So it's the SEMA build thing where it's got Bluetooth drive shafts and it's on airbags. And uh, there's all sorts of uh, shiny, cool powder coated parts under it. You know, it's a show truck essentially. So that was, uh, it was cool. It's cool to see that kind of stuff doesn't do anything for me, but I know a lot of people are into it. But um, yeah, the classic truck styling was big. You know, I think the classic vehicles are kind of, there wasn't a lot there and there was a lot of new, I saw a ton of G-bodies and uh, IROC Camaros and like the, the stuff that makes you put your mullet down and just shake it in the wind. Like the, the stuff, that's the kind of stuff I like. You know, if uh, I drive an IROC every day of the week, if we didn't live in Ohio and it snowed three feet here. Now that we've seen where the hobby currently sits, I'm going to ask you all to break out your crystal balls. And are you able to make any predictions on where you think uh, the gearhead community is heading, where the hobby is heading, where the where the industry is heading? So I, after walking around SEMA and checking it out, obviously our hobby is as strong as it's ever been. The key to keeping our hobby alive and doing that is getting the more youth involved. You um you see a lot of younger builders and uh, you know people appearing in the market, so that's really promising and good. I think electric swaps are going to get popular as battery technology and the electric motor technology gets a little more widely available and um, cheaper. So I think that's going to become a staple in our industry in the next 10 years. And uh, people are going to be doing it a lot. You know, I don't think electric swap first gen Camaros is a crazy thing to think about. And I think we're going to see them sooner than later. But other than that, I think the, the hobby's strong. Yeah, I don't think we're going anywhere soon. Yeah, you know, I, I would echo what Justin says. Uh, you know, electric is something that is, I think it, it's coming as, as an option. I don't think internal combustion is going anywhere, though. I think that we're going to have these two things coexisting and there's there's going to be new op- opportunities to, uh, you know, upgrade your vehicles uh, and, and make them electric. But I think also looking at expanding parts in the new generations of internal combustion. I know on the suspension side of things, for example, you know, Hotchkiss has spent a lot of time developing parts for 80s era vehicles and cars and trucks. So that's something that I think, you know, we'll see. You've already seen good guys sort of expand out, you know, the the threshold for what can come to their shows. Newer vehicles are now more welcome than ever. And I think we're seeing more and more parts being developed for those. Over at QA1, they developed suspension for uh, donks, boxes, and bubble type cars, right? So I think, you know, there's still plenty of room to develop and make parts for the traditional internal combustion. I don't think, that, like, like I said, I don't think that's going anywhere, but I think, you know, electric is here. It'll be interesting to see where that goes. And I did have a chance, I wanted to mention too, during one of the days, I had a chance to listen to Jamie Meyer from PRI speak and talk about advocacy and 
and protecting our hobby and what you can do to sign up. We've all talked about the RPM Act here before. I, I do think that involvement is going to be key to keeping our hobby strong. And, you know, there's opportunities to do that for people to get involved, uh, you know, to, to sign for the RPM Act, to become a PRI member as they advocate for our hobby. So I think it's it's going to remain strong. I think Hot Rodding is here to stay. And I think, you know, the, those types of uh, organizations are, are going to help us maintain that. But yeah, overall amount of just variety of vehicles between the 60s and and vintage vehicles, and I think expanding up and then modern internal combustion and electric, I think that the variety is and the opportunity is is just huge right now. I would kind of agree with Justin too on getting the younger generation involved in the community is going to be really critical. I know it was really cool this year to see uh, like the SEMA Young Guns like designation with Battle of the Builders, like we did work with the one who had the javelin. So I thought that was really nice. But yeah, I don't think our hobby is going to go anywhere. And on top of it, too, with EV coming into the mix and everything, I think that's going to add another layer for people to get into the industry if they weren't necessarily into all of the other engine swaps and stuff like that. And they're really intrigued with EV. That's another way to bring other people into the hobby. So I think it's nice that we're kind of expanding and growing into different segments there's something for everyone. So I think that's why SEMA is such a big show and people love going to it. You have everything you could ever want under one roof, basically, and outside. So to me, it's kind of fun to see all the different people that come into the show and then see where it goes next year. I mean, you never know sometimes. Sometimes you know the trends and then they surprise you and then you're like, pop, this random thing shows up. So who knows? Well, that is a nice dovetail in, into my final question, and that really is, what would you like to see next year? Now that you've experienced SEMA in a post- and pre-pandemic world, how would you like to see the SEMA show evolve in the coming years? Well, they just announced that they're going to expand the show. I mean, they're going to start expanding it out to different areas, I believe, of, of the city of Las Vegas. Uh, they're going to have more entertainment, uh, music, that type of stuff. And you know, what exactly the details of that remains to be seen. But, you know, they're looking to make this more of a spectacle, I guess, if it wasn't already. So that'll be interesting to see what happens there. But, you know, overall, I mean... I think they're doing a good job. I mentioned that new West Hall that, that they built and that footprint's larger. And I know, Nicole, you can speak to this, the Tesla loop where you could go from one side to the other. Um, so they had some transportation. I didn't realize about this. So I put in a lot of extra steps and took an extra like 20 minutes to walk out to the West Hall. And then somebody, when I was there, told me about that. But my point is, I think they're doing a good job of developing uh, new ways to navigate the show. I think they did a good job of keeping it to business affairs on the first three days and then making it so you could, you know, not have to navigate quite as tight of a crowd. I think that was a great thing that they did there. So overall, I mean, I think after a two year absence from the show, I think they're doing a, a pretty good job. Yeah. I really liked the new hall too. I thought it was, you know, it was a little further off the beaten path than the other, other areas, but with the Tesla loop, it was really nice. It was kind of fun to go in it, honestly, but I would say one thing and, I know with the Battle of the Builders, it's in the North Hall. I feel like it would be kind of cool if it somehow could move into Central or Main Hall because they have some really cool stuff. And I don't know if they get the foot traffic back in the North Hall like they would in Central Hall because I had a really good time walking through that area and just enjoying what these people did with their vehicles. I just thought that would be something different. And like maybe highlighting the SEMA young guns a little bit more, just so that way the younger crowd sees like, hey, you're getting recognition in this industry by the SEMA show. Like you're in Central Hall, you're in primetime action right there. That's my two cents. Yeah, that's a great point, Nicole. I, I think that highlighting the young up and comers in this industry and, you know, because we want to make it so the next generation keeps getting involved. And I think uh, highlighting them a little bit more. I think that's a great idea. I'm right there with you guys. The youth is what keeps us alive. If you don't have a generation to follow you. Obviously, that's kind of that's what means the end. So giving those guys the spotlight and uh, showing the absolutely amazing things that they're doing, it would be super cool. 
Like I said, I think the show with the addition of the new hall and that there was, uh, it's hard to cover even in the three or four days we're there. It's hard to walk the whole thing and cover it in. You know, that's going to be my number one SEMA recommendation to anybody that hasn't done it before. A, buy the best two pairs of shoes that money can buy because you're going to walk all the steps. Just to kind of give you guys an idea, over four days, I walked to just over 100,000 steps. You know, I have calves, calves of a god now. Like, they should be putting these bad boys in a, uh, you know, a sports magazine. But, yeah, no, the seat, like I said, for um, my impressions of my first SEMA, I can't wait to go back and uh, check it out and um, see what next year brings. Because that's the whole point is, you know, we get uh, 11 months of innovation in between these shows to see who brings the latest and greatest cool stuff to the show. Like you had said, there's something for everybody. Like I really enjoyed the tool section in, uh, in West Hall, but there's a hundred things in between there that you can check out and just kind of bask in. If you've never been and you're in the industry, I, I highly recommend going. Well, I think that's a good note to end on. And again, normally I would say thank you for your time, but you're Summit Racing employees, so I'll just tell you to get back to your regular jobs, right? I'm just kidding. Thank you so much uh, for the insight into this year's SEMA show. Looking forward to talking to you um, on the recap of the next year's show. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thanks for listening. This has been the On All Cylinders podcast. Powered by Summit Racing. Check out new episodes coming soon at onallcylinders.com. Onallcylinders.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.